All right, so let's do it. I'm going to talk about vehicle decks today, but I'm also going to talk about building sideboards for vehicle decks, because that's what's happening in the tournament coming up. You can have a sideboard for the top eight, and I know that that's new to some duels players, and I'm going to explore sideboard options. I'm going to use vehicles because it's a known quantity. It's a deck everybody's played against or with, and I don't know how many people will play it in the next tournament, but I will give you a little, a little preview into my testing or a little glimpse into it. Uh, vehicles is, in, is among my top four decks. I have four decks that I'm choosing from. Uh, three of them have vehicles in them, and two of them are vehicle themed. So I know right now you're all hoping I pick the one that is not vehicles. But anyway, that's a glimpse into where I'm at as to what's bestest in the format. But we're gonna talk today about building sideboards because I think that that's uncovered ground for duels and could be interesting. So if anybody remembers I did the quest for the best deck challenge last season which is I played the decks on ladder until they got two losses and the winner was Mardu vehicles very similar to this deck here with some changes recently but that's how I'm playing it right now on the ladder and a lot of people they're testing for a tournament is playing against the AI or playing against um, it's either to play the AI or to play on ladder. That's most of the testing that we can do. However, one thing that I can assure you is that the best ladder decks are not necessarily the best tournament decks. See, this deck is hedged. And what I mean by that is it leans mid-range because on ladder, you don't know if you're going to play against aggro, control, or other mid-range, or all various types of decks. There are matchups where you want to be aggressive, such as against ramp and control, and there are matchups where the aggression comes at you, such as zombies, elves even, you know, the, the really low to the ground decks, renown, green-white renown, green-white humans. So in those cases, you need some value, and you need t some removal. And this deck is a very good deck, but it is a hedged deck. And that's because all the games that we're playing are basically best of one. And even if I ran this in a tournament, it's similar to best of one, because you never know. You get mana screwed here, or you get uh, mana screwed there. Now, do I think that duels should be best of three format with sideboard? It doesn't matter what I think, but the current tournament has sideboards in the top eight, not in the Swiss rounds. So you still need a reasonably hedged deck or a deck that does some things really well and wins two out of three games in your Swiss rounds. But in the top eight, you get a sideboard, which is a new element. Now, this deck, like I said, it's hedged, so it can deal with almost anything that it comes across. Creatures that are smaller than, say, three or four, those run into Sky Sovereign and Glory Ringer and Archangel Avacyn can take over those games. So if the opponent plays aggro, we have cards up here in our five slot to deal with that. At the same time, if our opponent plays ramp or control, all the way down here are one drops that can turn on the beats right away, uh, selfless Spirit that can keep Sweepers from cleaning up our board. Car and cards like um, the Vehicles, which are just tough to remove, and Scrappy Scrounger, which is def just tough to remove. So it has game against both. But things change a lot when we talk about a sideboarding strategy. And so this is a hedge deck. If I were building a sideboard for this very hedged deck that can go either way, I would look into cards that just filled roles that are not necessarily met. So let's browse around and look for some cards that would be awesome in a deck like this and just kind of build it from top. So for one thing is frag, uh, Fragmentize, right? Fragmentize is a very good card. Uh, cut to Ribbons, uh, Snared is asking why not. I found I did not need it and there were only so many spots. I liked Glorybringer a lot more as my removal. Uh, cut to ribbons is decent on curve, but it's not. I ju it, it just wasn't what I needed necessarily. I still had no problem closing out games. It's a good card. Don't get me wrong about that for a minute. But like some things I considered cutting for it were walking ballista, and walking ballista is getting cut in standard, and that makes sense because the copycat is gone. But I would not cut walking ballista in duels. Look how much one toughness there is here. Toolcraft, selfless, glory bound, abbot. Veteran Motorist, there, there's just a lot of one toughness stuff. Thopter tokens, so I still think that Ballista is where you want to be. And that's probably what I would remove for it. I like my creature count the way that it is, so that this version's aggressive, but we'll get to cut to ribbons. Uh, Fragmentize is a really obvious card that you can consider for sideboarding as it shores up removal on some spots. 
Declaration in Stone is an interesting sideboard card. It can exile things like Ormodal or big patches of servo tokens when you run up against the token deck, making it probably a very strong one. Some people might consider Blessed Alliance. I think it's wrong for this type of deck, personally. Reprisal's a consideration, but probably for a green-red monsters deck where Unlicensed Disintegration can fill that role. And Declaration Stone could do the same job at uh, without taking a different spot from your board. Do you want more Planeswalkers? Maybe. You might want to do a mid-range game with more Planeswalkers, things of that nature. Uh, Echo Jin says, I came late, but why talk about sideboarding when the game doesn't have it? Because it's going to be in a tournament. And let's see here. A number of other options, but the main thing that I want to stress with this type of deck that I'm that's already hedged against a wide variety of field is all that you need out of your sideboard is a few what people would say hosers. C cards like Fragmentize that are that shore up holes in your game or just make the deck all around even more versatile. Cast out you could consider. You probably don't need different threats. You could also you could add a few low threats if you thought they were narrow, but uh, cut to ribbons is another. Just having the right removal cards for the right threats to go along with your the rest of your game plan is probably good. There are some interesting options because this is already a mid-range-ish deck, which would be bringing in, what if we so sideboarded in Planar Outburst, and what if we sideboarded in Radiant Flames? What if we made those changes to our deck, right? Hmm, interesting. So now what does our deck do? Well, we want to take out all of these lower drops. Um, probably cards like Toolcraft, Inventor's Apprentice, but at the same time, Selfless Spirit can make our stuff indestructible, so when we wrath the, the board, our things stay around. I think even if we make these changes, Veteran Motorist and Abbott can stay because they generate value and make it more likely to find our awesome sweepers. But what else can we do from a sideboarded spot? Well, we can play a more controlling game. We can go bigger which is a lot of fun actually out of the board. And it's a strategy that happens in constructed magic every now and then. So what if we sideboarded in cards like this? What if we brought in Chandra Flamecaller? What if we also brought in, um, let's see, you'll find it here. Black Enchantment, Rare, 2-3, Oath of Liliana, right? Now we have a bunch of Planeswalkers up here and we have uh, Oath of Liliana to play a more controlling game and make our opponent kill their creatures and make zombies. That's pretty fun. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see, what would supplement a plan like that? Probably go up, I'm now I'm keeping an eye on the bottom. We're at 69 cards. Once we get to 75, we basically have a full sideboard. Are there other black cards that would be really useful? I think if a strategy like that were taking off, Probably a card like Fatal Push would be helpful. Now, we can't have too many because we're low on black sources, right? So that's important to know. But there's other tricks that you can do in your sideboard, and I'll just I'll just show a couple fun ones. So if we run, say, two Fatal Push, what is another way? We could run another black source of sorts. Believe it or not, we can do just about anything with the sideboard, including... We could have a basic land in there. We could have one basic land in our sideboard for when we go up to a bigger deck, so we're more likely to have a black source and draw our fifth and sixth mana when we need it. So that that can make things pretty fun. So now I'm up to now I'm up to 72 cards. I think another fragmentize is probably good, right? And then I think that another uh, declaration stone is probably good against tokens to keep them from going too wide on us. I like the Oaths of Lily. They probably stay in the deck. More Planeswalkers would be good here. We have both Chandras, we have Nahiri. Let's add Soren, the Grim Nemesis himself, as he's the easiest to cast from our mana. These Planeswalkers with their double black are less likely to get cast, but Soren isn't. Okay, so. Uh, we're up to 75 cards. The cards that we added were one Swamp, one Soren, one Chandra, two Planar Outburst, and one, uh, or two Radiant Flames, two Oath of Liliana, two Declaration Stone, 
two fragmentize, and two fatal push. So after sideboarding, we can do, let's see, we can cut 15 cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably eight, nine, maybe. I'm just looking at how the deck would look after sideboards. So it seems I'm a bit too all in on the plan because we have too much uh, extra removal. So some of this is flex removal. We don't want that much removal in deck. So if we're up against tokens or something that needs to be exiled like gods or Ormondal, we run some number of these. Maybe we shave on unlicensed disintegration. Maybe we don't bring radiant flames in in some cases. It's interesting. The main problem with this sideboarding plan right now is control. Like, what do we do against control? There's not a lot that we add to help against control. However, that is one of the problems with having a hedge deck and then sideboarding is it's hard to completely get low and aggressive against control, which is what you want to be. Your best hope is to grind them out with scrap heap scroungers and things of that nature. So that's an example sideboard of how to turn into an even bigger deck and basically turn into a Planeswalker control deck. For fun, let's uh, let's say that we're playing another vehicle deck, just a straight up vehicle versus vehicle, and afterwards we wanna play Planeswalker control, do like a transformational sideboard type of thing. I'm just gonna do make some cuts from the deck to show what that might look like. And we're gonna get back down to say 15 to 60 cards. Yep, I think these can go. One, two, three, one, two. And actually, believe it or not, I'm going to keep cutting on Licensed Disintegrations. Because Unlicensed Disintegration is a decent card as kind of a terror effect. But I need more versatility and I want to be lower. And Fragmentize and Fatal Push allow me to do that against vehicles. So now let's look at this deck. We can also, probably what I could have also done there is cut the Heart of, now Heart of Curing Cruise itself, maybe even Copter gets cut, but we're down to 12 creatures. But now we're playing like the super awesome Planeswalker control deck, which is pretty exciting. I don't know, I'd have a really good time transforming into this deck. I, are they gonna see Radiant Flames coming? Maybe, maybe not. Deckless will be public, but that doesn't mean they know how you sideboard. Will they see Planar Outbursts coming out of your creature deck? Maybe not. So that's an idea of a sideboarding tactic you can take with this deck. But I'm going to show you a, a very different situation, and one that I recommend more for tournaments. I told you from the get-go that this is a hedged deck. You know what I mean? Um, so you're already trying to beat everything. I don't recommend trying to beat everything in tournaments. I recommend trying to beat something specific. So this is an idea of an unhedged, red-white, aggressive, vehicle-style deck. And how we can build a sideboard for something like this. So this one is just trying to be very, very low to the ground and get them dead quickly and just present a ton of pressure. We have a sub-energy theme because we're running Harness Lightning, Aether Sphere Harvester, Aether Hub, and Aether Chaser. So we've got a little bit of an energy theme, but this thing is a super low to the ground beatdown machine, complete with Always Watching, which is interesting in this deck, and 21 Land. Uh, let's see... Yeah, there's your curve. Just getting flat. Just just getting low and getting them dead. That's what this deck wants to do. And I would run this deck in a tournament if I felt really prepared to battle um, decks that weren't prepared for aggro. So untuned midrange, untuned control, ramp decks. This would be a really good deck for that type of tournament. But what do you do with a sideboard for a deck like this? And I think that this is where a common mistake is. People are just aren't they, they think that aggro is just dead when you build a sideboard. So they'll throw in probably four fragmentizes and uh, four other hoser type cards and call it a day. So there are a few things that you can do. If you're going against something bigger than you, then you want to be able to either get way under it, which this deck is already low to the ground, or you want to be able to disrupt it. So some kind of a disruptive element. Now I'm not against running a fragmentizer too. I'm just gonna put one in there as a placeholder. But if you want to disrupt a deck that's going bigger than you, you have to just know what their game plan is and how you can break it up. So where are some cards that can do that for us? We've already got one Thalia in there. We can definitely add another. If it's a ramp deck, I can't... Like, if you're worried about ramp decks, I can't tell you how much a card like this is a pain in the neck for a ramp deck. 
and I would really strongly consider it against ramp. It's it's such a pain. It really is. Um, if you're trying to win a straight up race with aggro, a lantern scout is probably not a terrible sideboard option, but there's probably better. I'm just gonna set that on on the back burner for a minute. If you are playing against another deck that's similar to this one, that is trying to go big, Collective Effort can be a heck of a blowout. That's really where it's at its finest, so a couple mirror match options there. But as far as disrupting bigger decks, some interesting cards you could use include, like, Make a Stand. If your opponent is trying to languish or Yehenny's Expertise you, this is not a good card. But if they're trying to Radiant Flames or Planar Outburst you, this is the type of card that you could run to get them dead quicker and disrupt their plans, at least to some extent. So that's an, a sideboard strategy option. You could run the transformational sideboard like what I talked about with the other deck, but I don't think it's as good when this deck is super unhedged. I think in sideboarding you want to counter the opponent, you want to disrupt the opponent's strategy. So it's pure aggro before sideboarding, it's disruptive aggro afterwards. You take a shot at specifically what you think they're going to play. Let me get over into red cards. Uh, oh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I guess. So, how else can we disrupt what they're trying to do? Well, if they're running other big cards, or if they're trying to take us on creature to creature, maybe if they run a card like a Glory Bringer, then trees and effects aren't terrible. I would probably run Kari Zev's Expertise first, but Traitorous Instinct, um, or just regular Active Trees, and could be talked about. I think that Kari Zev's Expertise is by far the upgrade of those so you can consider that Let's see also um this is the kind of card that i love out of sideboard against uh control as a sort of a disruptive like i said becoming disruptive aggro play something that they can't kill if you know that they don't run a lot of exile effects or if their exile effects are anguish on making that cost them three life and they're likely to sideboard those out against your hyper aggressive strategy an indestructible threat like this is just an, a fantastic sideboard option. If all their removal is damage based, a recursive threat might be the right option, but I think we already have a few of those in Scrap Heap Scrounger. Where's another card? I must have moved right past it. Another card that could be considered an interesting way to disrupt your opponent and steal victories. Where is it? I guess I keep going past it because I never run it. But I know it's up here at, like, the four spot, right? Let me see here. I'll know it as soon as I see it. Ah, uh, is this it? No. Uh, yes. Yes, actually. Let's see. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Destructive tampering. Uh, destroying target artifact or creatures without flying can't block this turn. So if you're up against tokens... And they run, say, a few vehicles like Smuggler's Copter or, um, or uh, what's the other card? Aether Sphere Harvester. This can be a good way to nix those, similar to what I ran into in the quarters of the, or in the semis of the last showdown. But how about that second mode, right? Say they have the board gummed up with tokens, and you say all creatures without flying can't block this turn? Boom. How often, how big would that have been in the finals of Steam Showdown where Mobius was taking on uh, Unbeatable and that board was just like so gummed up. So this would be a very, a very, very uh, good um, disruptive aggro type card because if this, if their plan is to fill the board full of tokens and you play this, you just run right through them. Uh, absolutely fantastic kind of next level. So if you're up against a Planeswalker deck, maybe you consider a Devour in Flames. I would not run more than one. I really don't want to draw it very often, as setting yourself back on mana is not cool. But it's an interesting card that maybe goes in there against decks that play like Woodland Wanderers and such too. Big stuff. Just big stuff uh, solutions. Uh, there's Kari Zev's expertise. So uh, in this case, I'm trying to I'm trying to talk a bit more about a disruptive act, like sticking to your main game plan. This is another card that interests me. Um, one damage to each of up to two target creatures. Those creatures can't block this turn. I wouldn't want to run many, but there's a lot of times where in an aggressive mirror, a card like this could do a lot of work. It could take out, say, a motorist and a glory bound initiate. But if it's later in the game and you just need to get through their blockers, like they have a Thalia or something like that, you can hit that with a gambit and then run right past it. 
So stopping people from blocking that want to block is a good play. A card like Boiling Earth, or probably even better than that, uh, what's the new card? It's called Rending Volley or something? Barrage of Arrows? I think Rending Volley is something different. Um, where is it? It's like a one drop. Yeah, there. Blazing Volley. That's it. Blazing Volley. One damage to each creature your opponent controls. Another good kind of token beater. And I think that when you are trying to kind of have a variety of cards like this, you want a variety. I that's why you don't have sideboards with a ton of four ofs because you keep your core deck aggressive. You don't want to mess it up to out all the cards that make your deck tick. You just want to supplement it with a few cards that use special situations. And I really wouldn't adjust in wouldn't because your opponent doesn't have a sweeper. Or what if they get it off before you have them? You can't you can't make a stand uh, to protect a make a stand. You know what I mean? And if the situation's not right, you just don't want the stuff. You don't know how your opponent's necessarily going to sideboard. All you can do is make some guesses and then draw them. Perhaps that the uh, semis, when the that the top sideboards play, they help them be best of five because it gives you more opportunity for sideboard cards than make an impact. That stuff. Anyway, I hope that was at least semi helpful. So now I'm gonna, if if anybody wants to, I'm gonna give it a few minutes. If there are any questions uh, from the chat here on Twitch about sideboarding or any specific cards or what I would sideboard it in for or how I'd do a sideboard, I would love to get them. And I'm going to just sit here for about a minute and see if anybody wants to ask anything. You're also welcome to ask later if you watch this on YouTube for YouTube comments, if you want to. I'll try to respond within a day or two. Hey, we got one. Thank you. In energy decks, uh, Golgari in my case, is there any green card that's a must in the sideboard? Uh, yes, there certainly is. Um, and that card is Reclamation Sage. If you're not up to all three copies in your main deck, I believe that is probably the single best sideboard card as it's a very high variance card. Um, if your opponent doesn't control a decent target for a Reclamation Sage, it's a very bad three mana for a two one creature. It's just horrible. But if your opponent does control any kind of a valuable target, especially something like a Smuggler's Copter, a Heart of Kirin, a Sphinx's Tutelage, a Dynavolt Tower, something that they put a very serious, very, very serious um, emphasis on with their deck building, Reclamation Sage is the best card in the game. It, it really is that much better than anything else. There's nothing else that comes down on turn three and just neutralizes a premium threat while giving you a body and a presence on the board. One could say Liliana is the next closest thing, and that's mythic, you know, little Liliana. So I would say if you are green, I would run three Reclamation Sages, and I would not be, I would make sure those, if they didn't make the main deck because they're that good right now, uh, they should be in the sideboard. In fact, a big part of my testing for this tournament, the last tournament, and the one before, because Reclamation Sage is such a boss card and situational, is it was important to me to know what is the best Reclamation Sage deck. Um, if Just by knowing what that is, you already know kind of your enemy when you're playing something like Vehicles, which I played in the last tournament. So if I, I believed pretty strongly that the best Reclamation Sage deck was Team Merge, last tournament so i actually had uh some decisions on how i would play team merge fortunately nobody played it on xbox but at, but um then uh nighthawk showed him what's up on uh, steam showdown i thought that was just part of being the best reclamation sage deck as you get the emerge value off your reclamation sage and you can recur it with pulse Marasa to do it over and over uh, i think the second best reclamation sage deck last time was green black Green black aggro, so I would certainly consider it for that. I hope that answers the question. 
Sleep Pumper, what do you think about Midnight Oil versus Control Decks? I don't like that. I think that you have to remember when you go to top eight, you have to absolutely remember two things. Uh, first of all, your deck list and your sideboard is public. If you have Midnight Oil in your sideboard and your opponent is a control deck and they look at your sideboard, they should know very well that it's coming in. And I think that trying to grind out a control deck right now is a very bad idea for the most part if you're not doing it with, with a recursive threat. Midnight Oil isn't a threat. It provides more cards. So if the opponent can still answer all your threats because they're still outdrawing you with Pull From Tomorrow and Glimmer of Genius, then your Midnight Oil isn't helping you as much as you need. And your opponent can keep can add enchantment removal or something like that to their deck. Also, if you're up against control, they'll have counter spells. A four mana threat card like that against a control deck, I don't like very much. Um, because at four mana, they're almost assured and I mean assured to have counter spells available to them, unless they kept their enchantment removal in, in which case you're in an even worse position because they knew you'd board in Midnight Oil. So I'm, I don't think that that is the kind of card that you want. I, I think it's a neat idea, but I think it's actually worse in a world of sideboards than it is as a main deck card because you have a chance of running up against decks with no solution to it in the main deck. Uh, now that there are sideboards, I think that they'll either be able to solve it or just straight up beat it. So that's my opinion on Midnight Oil. What else do we have here? Wolf, how, okay, see, how do you sideboard when decklist is 75 cards? Honor system. Uh, Shard says you've published your main deck and sideboard. If you play anything not in your main deck before the sideboard matches, you get a warning. Okay, it looks like that was answered. Um, the sideboard only comes into effect in the top eight. So you're building your sideboard against what you expect to be the meta, which the meta, if you're right in the first place, still goes to top eight. And that's where your sideboard uh, will help you or won't help you. Now, once you're up there, you do not have to, re like you don't have to record anymore. So you don't have to be recording while you do your sideboarding either, which is also a bit of an honor system. That's probably where, stre where stream sniping would be the worst is if they sniped what you're sideboarding. But yeah, you don't, you just, uh, if you're looking for mechanics on how to keep your sideboard separate from your deck, you can build, like I would just duplicate left trigger. I would duplicate this deck. I would go in. I would work on the sideboarded version of my deck, and then I would uh, keep the original deck whole so I didn't make a mistake about playing with the deck. And then I would delete the sideboarded version after the match. So I was always running the same main deck in every game. So I would copy, I would make my sideboard adjustments, I would have my sideboard of 15 written down so I didn't sideboard anything I wasn't allowed to. And then after the match, I would delete the copy. So. Maybe that helps a little. All right, any other questions? And thank you for those questions. Um, it can be deck specific if you like, I'm here for you. If you like, I will not read your name uh, so the YouTube audience doesn't know what you're considering playing. I was careful not to mention the name of the person who asked the question about the energy deck. We'll give it another about 60 seconds if anybody wants to ask anything. Shard uh, asks a joke question. Should everyone play Insult to get around the fog? No, they shouldn't play it for that reason, but there are certainly cases where Insult could be a very good sideboard card. Um, I would think specifically against a control deck that does not play many counter spells um, that might be low on counter magic, like say a white black control or an Abzan control list. Maybe you don't want to put too much on the board because you know it'll get swept because they run say four 
two languish, two Yehenis, two planar outbursts, something like that. So maybe you play turn two Voltaic Brawler, turn three Voltaic Brawler, turn four Insult. You didn't have to deploy any more creatures, but you deal a ton of damage. And then they sweep the board, and you untap and cast Lath New Hellion, and it's game over. Something like that. There's probably a spot where Insult would be an interesting sideboard card. All right, it looks like that's the questions for right now. So I'm just going to grab, I'm just going to pick a deck and I'm going to go play some ladder games. And you guys can ask more questions if you want to, if you think of them. Oh, excuse me. If you think of them after we uh, go out and hit the ladder a bit. For those of you watching later, we have 27 viewers, so I don't know how many are considering enrolling in any of the tournaments, but I would encourage all of you to enroll. The worst that can happen is you get to play some matches against quality opponents, see how you do, and learn some more about magic. So it is uh, certainly something to do. You don't have to record. That used to be a requirement, so perhaps that's news to some of you that record, recording your games is no longer a requirement. All you have to do is report them on the forum at No Goblins Allowed or email them to Kreider, who has a Gmail address, so anybody can do that. And let's get to work. <laughs> When talking about what to sideboard out, I would say understanding what your narrow cards are. So what's about to happen here is this Magma Spray is about to be an awesome card as we're gonna get that cat out of our life. And the second one is probably going to be good too because yeah, um, they're sure to have more of these types of cards. But against a deck with where almost everything has three toughness or more or there are no small creatures, Magma Spray is absolutely useless. It's a, it's a dead draw. You never want to have it. You never want to play it. So because of that, you would want to sideboard out your Magma Sprays, and you'd want to make sure you had options in your deck that were good against those situations where Magma Spray is bad. Uh, an, Dispel comes to mind right off the top of my head. But other forms of counter magic or other win condition type threats are uh, things I'd consider. Isn't the top 8 mandatory to record? Apparently the top 8 is still mandatory to record, but here's the good news. If you don't know how to record and you just want to play, you can play. And if you make top 8, you can learn how to record. Or you can... I wouldn't recommend... Like, I would never do this, and I don't necessarily recommend it at all, but if you just can't record or have no desire to record and want nothing to do recording, you can just call it a day and say, I'm not going to do that. In the top and uh, concede your top eight although but you still get to play the Swiss rounds it's free to enter and you get to play magic and I believe the entire top eight gets prizes if it's large enough but pro I promise you like you can figure out how to record if you want to I wouldn't be mad at anybody if they got to the top eight and then threw in the towel. That wouldn't bother me. I'd understand. But I'd really just say learn to record. Recording's fun. Like, I only bought my... You've heard this story if you've followed me a while, but I only bought my Xbox uh, to play in a tournament, and I had to learn how to record to do it. And that's the only reason I'm making videos today is because I was required to learn how to record. All right. Well, I definitely want a land. So I'll make it the island. And let's bring down the glory. Or the glory. This is a card that is, it's, an, it's a hedge on its own, right? It's, um, so we're playing blue-red control. And I'm running glory bringer. And glory bringer is a good card. But you don't want it in all your matchups. And it's... It, it might be a good sideboard card for this deck, but that's kind of what I'm trying it out for, by the way. Anyway, an exerted glory bringer is going to be hanging out. We'll see if our opponent has a way to deal with it. They do have Heart of Curin chilling on the battlefield. 
And they have a Lone Rider. Interesting. So we've got a Feisty Seal uh, here early on. Looks like a white aggro deck with a lot of new Aether Revolt type cards. And this turn is interesting. We can deploy the Dynavolt Tower with the Harness Lightning up. That seems really good. We could also deploy Jace, but if our opponent finds a way to kill it, that's bad. So I think it's more straight. I think it's a pretty straightforward turn. Dynavolt Tower. Now, if you if I go up against an opponent and I'm running this deck which has Dynavolt Tower in it, and I run up against opponent who has three Reclamation Sage in their sideboard, this is another interesting part of the game. You can assume that they're going to put in their Reclamation Sages so they don't lose to Dynavolt Tower. You can double assume this if you beat them with Dynavolt Tower the first game or in the Swiss rounds. And then, so if you're assuming that they're putting in Reclamation Sage, you can take your Dynavolt Tower out of your deck and leave them without good targets. That's another kind of fun way to get them uh, in sideboarding speak. And here comes an attack. What do I want to do? I guess I'll do nothing since I get to glory bring, exert, kill that next turn. So I don't need to cast either of these right this minute. Alright, that's a good draw. Let's bring the dragon. Even at just every other turn with no untappy effects, Glorybringer is a heck of an effective card. It just whittles down the life total and keeps removing threats from the board until they kill it. And if they're taking their time to kill a Glorybringer, they can't be killing you. So, it's an interesting card. We don't have Inferno Titan, but we've got Glorybringer. He's going to fire up the Colossus. Colossus to Heart of Curin. Okay. Now what? You want to activate your Colossus, perhaps? I would have fun with that. Selfless Spirit. Well, that's a problem. So now I think what I want to do is I want to harness lightning and kill this Heart of Curin. And then his Peacekeeper Colossus can be dispersed or it can be fiery impulsed and towered. We'll see. Yep. Go ahead and hit that crew. There we go. All right. We can disperse the Colossus or we can kill it. I feel like killing it is probably the way to be. Let me make sure. Yep, Spell Mastery. Would be very embarrassing if we lacked it. And a concession. Uh, let's play it out. And one, two, three, four. And down comes Selfless, which might be a pain in the neck. But eventually, if he can't kill Glorybringer, it will pick that thing off. If we draw a land, I'll feel completely comfortable dispersing, or uh, holding up Disperse with Jace. We did not. But since I don't have much else to do, I think I'll play this and try to draw a land. And if the opponent spends their turn dealing with Jace, then the Glorybringer untaps and deals with some creatures. And there's the land, so how convenient. It was either going to be that or a cool spell, right? So it's kind of a no-lose situation. We're definitely just going to let Jace take the hit. If it's not going to kill it, we're not going to worry about it. Dispersing one of those is not an appealing play. I want to glory bring kill the spirit, so I'm going to scat the essence of that. There's a draw. Hmm. That's plus Jace. I thought about bouncing my own glory bringer, but I don't think that will be necessary. There's another draw. Yay! Attack! Exert! Kill that spirit! It 
for four. Pass the turn. Things are all coming up CGB on this one. The, the white aggro embalm ran into the Dynavolt Tower and the Glorybringer, and the repeatable value has been a big headache for them. Despite the early Heart of Kirin. Uh, we do have plenty of embalming little kitties, don't we? Let's pull some things for out of tomorrow. Now, do we start killing those cats? If I don't, what happens? I guess we'll start with a Radiant Flames. And then we can pick them off with Tower and Glory Bringer next turn. Oh, double Radiant Flames. Convenient. Yeah, that's fine too. That that can do some work. Seven? Seven. And we still have the disperse? Yeah. That's pretty good. blow up the first wave of kitties. No, not the kitty. Don't smash the kitty. Oh, what do you do? What do you do? I guess you declare that in stone. Do I care? I don't care right now. That's fine. Chandra finishes the game faster anyway. We just have better premium threats to worry about. Katie's back. I assume other kitty comes back? No more kitties. Oops, didn't crack the clue. I was looking at a graveyard. Meant to, but that's the way it goes. Oh, they always tap wrong when I want to play a Radiant Flames. Why is that? Something about Aether Hub and Radiant Flames just don't want to cooperate. All right, send them in, this, in for six. Draw that card. And one, two, three, four, five. Can't think of any combination of cards that would punish me for playing a tap land there. Maybe double sensor into Glimmer of Genius, but then I still get to see three new cards because of the clue. So deciding whether or not to play a tap land or untap land is Sometimes it matters, sometimes it's like really straightforward. All right, Gideon. Well, if he makes the emblem, I just shoot it with the tower. I do not need to counter this. One of the great things about Dynavolt Tower is the game you have against Planeswalkers, without question. Glorybringer was going to untap, but I don't need it. Uh, just because you can protect your Glorybringer with a Disperse or something like that doesn't mean you should. All right, away with you. He did go for the... The AI did go for the emblem. I mean, I could have, and the ending would probably have been the same. Like, we're still going to likely win the game. We have a pretty huge advantage anyway. But Disperse is the closest thing to a counter that I have, or just a universal solution that I can keep for whatever my opponent does. So I like to save that for anything that isn't going to actively cost me the game. It's lethal if absolutely nothing goes wrong. But I don't need to be in a rush. Uh, you can't uh, you can't exert it to hit players, though. If you're talking about doing four damage to target player, that's not how Glorybringer works.
Alright, he's at two, so we just need to use like a fiery impulse or something on our own creature to get the energy, and then we can finish G a game. Woohoo!